the judgment of you. But it didn't always start that way. You probably know nothing about me at all. You read through the book of Acts there in Acts chapter 23, Acts chapter 24, as recorded by that faithful Christian chronicler, that guy named Luke. I am Antonius Felix. Claudius Antonius Felix. Put in power, put in judgment of all the people of Judea, 50 A.D by none other than Claudius Caesar himself. You know your Roman history. You know that we once ruled the known world. We you know that at one point in time, we were the biggest empire in history itself. Augustus Caesar, he came to power. He ruled Rome, the first Roman emperor until 14 AD and then followed by his nephew Tiberius. He himself was followed by his nephew. You know him. Caligula. Caligula, a corrupt Caesar, an insane Caesar, a crazy Caesar who ruled Rome for all of two years and then was assassinated by his own Praetorian guards and then Claudius, Claudius took over and that's who appointed me to be governor, to be procurator of that small region in the empire, that region known as Judea. But I was not born to power. I was not born to a position of wealth or prestige. I did not come from a noble family. No, I was born a slave. If you follow the line of Caesar, Caesar had a sister named Octavia. And Octavia was married to a man named Mark Anthony. You know Mark Anthony, don't you? Mark Anthony was married four times, and his fourth wife, before he got with Cleopatra, his fourth wife was none other than the sister of Augustus Caesar. And while they were together, they had two daughters, the younger daughter, Antonia Minor. And Antonia Minor went to the slave market one day and bought two slaves. I was one of them. A little boy born into slavery, born from a slave woman, sold into slavery, sold to be a servant, a lackey, to do whatever my mistress commanded me to do. And she lived until 37 AD. And in her will, when she died, I was set free. And at that time, Rome ruled Judea and Claudius decided that it would be almost a joke to put a former slave like me in charge. These rebellious people, these stubborn people, these hard-headed, hard-hearted people, these people that were always in rebellion against Rome, this troublesome region, why not put a slave as governor over these people to rule them and to judge them? And so in 50 AD, I, Claudius Antonius Felix, became governor of Judea, also known as procurator. That meant I got to judge cases that any time anyone broke the law, any time anyone had a dispute, any time anyone came to trial for whatever reason, they would come to me. No jury, no gathering of your peers, no I and I alone would decide the case. I was famous, famous throughout the Roman Empire, not only famous throughout the Roman Empire, but infamous within that region called Judea. If you came to me with some kind of a case, some kind of disagreement with your fellow man, some kind of a dispute, I would rule in favor if you gave me a little bit of money or maybe gave me a lot of money. 
The more money you gave me, the more I would rule in your favor, the more that I would, you know, work to your advantage. I was famous throughout all Judea for doing this, not only for accepting bribes in which I became more and more wealthy by the day, but there were people who lived there in Judea who started to denounce my corruption. Naturally, I didn't want this to get all the way back to Caesar, all the way back to Rome. The Senate might recall me. They might take away my position of power and prestige. They might even confiscate my wealth, my property. They might even make a slave of me yet again. So anyone who complained about me, anyone who protested my rule or my judgments, I had them assassinated. As a matter of fact, the high priest of the temple at that time there in Jerusalem, a man named Jonathan, he became very outspoken about the way I was governing the region, the way I was ruling the people there in Judea, and he was gathering a gathering unto himself, and so I hired a group of people known as Sicarii. men who carried daggers in their sleeves and they would go into a crowd and when people were crowded about they would pull those daggers out and stab that person hoping to kill them hoping to take away their life and I had Jonathan assassinated and I covered it up so well so incredibly well no one was ever prosecuted I got away with it All was going well for me there in the region of Judea. My wealth and power and prestige were growing day by day. And suddenly one day I I get news from the commander there in the garrison in Jerusalem, there in the fortress Antonia, there right next to the temple, that that a riot breaks out among the people, the Jewish people, they begin to scream and yell and throw stones, and, and, and the garrison had to go out and rescue this man named Paul, this man from Tarsus, half Roman, half Jewish. He is proclaiming that this guy named Jesus, Jesus from Nazareth, has lived, had a ministry, has suffered, has died, and Paul is telling everyone that this Jesus has risen from the dead, that they went to check the tomb, the tomb was empty, the body was not there. Paul even goes so far as to say that after this resurrection, Paul himself met with this Jesus on the road to Damascus. And what I learned about this Paul is for 15 years, He's been traveling throughout the Roman Empire, going on missionary journeys, spreading the news, spreading the word. This Jesus of Nazareth, he is the Messiah. He is the Savior. He is the one who through his righteous blood washes away all sin. He is the one who has overcome death and the grave. And now he has been arrested. And brought to me for judgment. I put him in jail. I put him in prison right away. He tried to make his case in front of me and I thought to myself, he has followers, he has people who are supporting him. Obviously, he has some kind of a financial connection to these people who call themselves Christians. So if I put him in jail, maybe his followers will come to me and they will literally buy him out of jail. It would be that incredibly easy. Bring me a bag of gold, bring me a bag of silver coins and I will set him free. Shocked and surprised I was that they would not participate in corruption. I left Paul in jail for five days and thought I'd give him time to think. They are surrounded by the dungeon walls, the cold stone walls of the dungeon, Herod's own prison. But rather than being depressed or 
despondent about his predicament, Paul seemed to relish the moment. Rather than sitting in stupefied, stupefied silence, rather than, than feeling all sorry for himself, Paul saw this as an opportunity to share this gospel message with all the prisoners who were there in jail. He would use that as an opportunity to make the analogy to Christ. Christ Jesus who said, I have come to set the prisoners free, said Jesus. And Paul says, not freedom from these four walls, but freedom from sin, freedom from guilt, freedom from shame, freedom from death, freedom to go to God, to ask for forgiveness, and to be given the love of God through his son, Jesus Christ. I invited his accusers to come down from Jerusalem. And they came. And they flattered me. Even though none of the Jewish people liked me, even though I had brought death and destruction and corruption to the Jewish people, they came in in that trial and they told me how great I was and how peace had ruled and how I was wise beyond all measure and how I would make a wonderful judgment. And then Paul stood up and he spoke in his own defense. Look, I too am a Jewish believer. I follow all the rules, regulations, rituals, and commands of the Old Testament, but I know that this Jesus is the Messiah, the very one prophesied in the Old Testament. Shut up, I said! Things are getting out of hand. Back to prison, I sent Paul. I kept him there for two years. Two years in prison not condemned, not judged, not sentenced, but detained. I thought that as long as I had him, as long as I had captured this individual, the Christian movement was growing every day by leaps and bounds, and the more people became Christians, the larger that Christian group grew, the more financial opportunity I saw in that group. Surely they would see their leader, their principal preacher, suffering there in the dungeons of that jail, and they would want to come and offer me a bribe to get him out. But even after two years of being in prison, even after two years of being chained, even after two years of having his liberty taken away, Paul would not participate in my corruption. nor would his followers. Periodically, I would trot Paul out, and I would talk to him, and listen to his message, try to convince him, you know, there, <laughs> there is a way out of this, you know. There, there is a way that I can set you free, but all Paul would do was talk to me about Jesus. All Paul would do while he was in prison Prisoners would come, prisoners would go. He would tell them about Jesus Christ. Guards would come and guards would go and Paul would tell them about Jesus Christ. I would have Paul chained to a Roman soldier to bring him out of the prison and into my judgment hall and on the journey there and on the journey back again, Paul would talk to this Roman soldier about Jesus Christ. I wasn't interested in Jesus. I was interested in money. But Paul used every opportunity to talk about the wealth found in knowing Jesus. In his own defense, Time and time again, he would say, I'm not here because I, I broke the law. I'm here because I believe in the Savior. 
It was as though he was being put on trial for being a Christian. I sit in judgment. And if I were to sit in judgment of all of you, if I were to put you on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? If I were to bring out the evidence and look, for example, at your bank account and see how you spend your money, would it show Christian virtue? If I were to sit down and look at a list of all the television shows that you watch, all the magazines that you read, all the books that you have on your shelves there at home, would there be enough evidence in all of those things to convict you of being a Christian? If I were to eavesdrop on all your conversations, the words, the thoughts that you have in your head, the things that you say one to another, would there be enough evidence in all those words and all those writings and all those conversations, would there be enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? If I were to walk into your home and look at all the artwork that you have hanging on your walls, would that be enough evidence to convict you of believing in Christ is your Savior. It's a good question. A good question indeed. Because what I've learned from the Apostle Paul is that being a Christian isn't simply giving lip service to God. It's following him by the way you live, by the things you look at, by the things you say, and the thoughts that you think. Would there be enough evidence in your life to bring about a conviction? That, my friends, is a very good question. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen.